Amen. Um, if you're able, stand with me. We're on uh, page 997, if you have the Bible from the back. It's Romans 1, 1 through 17. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh, and was appointed to the and was appointed to be the powerful son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship to bring the obedience of faith for the sake of his name to all the Gentiles, including you who are also called by Jesus Christ. To all or who in Rome, loved by God and called as saints, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because the news of your faith is being reported in all the world. God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in telling the good news about his son, that I constantly mention you, always asking in my prayers that if it is somehow in God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I want very much to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I often planned to come to you, but this was prevented until now, in order that I might have fruitful ministry among you, just as I had among the rest of the Gentiles. I am obligated both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of its power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it is the righteousness of God. It is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Thank you, Casey. All right. If you did not grab one of these scripture notebooks on your way in, this is your chance to get one and, I, and don't feel awkward, just do it right now, seriously, because I'm gonna wait. If you didn't get one, go grab one. And on the table back there, there are pens. Um, thank you. This is, this is what I've been telling you about. If you haven't been here before in one of our series, this little notebook is the entire book of Romans with a facing note page so that throughout the, next, the coming months, you can mark it up. If you have a nice Bible and don't like to write in it, I get it. That's why we use these things. So please use it. Uh, it's our gift to you and bring it with you each week. Uh, something else in conjunction with that is uh, for the fall, we are not planning any of our community groups or small groups. We currently have a men's cohort that's, that's got two more months. And then uh, we're wrapping up a new members group also. So we will not have groups for the fall, but what we would encourage you to do Get these handy dandy things and then maybe grab a friend, a couple friends, and each week, if you can get together even for 30 minutes and read the passage for the coming Sunday, it's what we do at Panera on Wednesday mornings at seven. You're always welcome to join us there. But just take 30 minutes or so, maybe more, and just talk about and discuss and study the passage for the coming week. Um, I promise you it will be a blessing to you. I promise you that the Lord will fill the time, that he'll open your understanding and it will produce fruit in your lives. If you have any questions about that, feel free to come talk to me. Um, but I wanna encourage you to get into the word uh, for yourself and with a couple others if possible. Awesome. Um, before we even started local church officially, uh, we were hanging out with some different people and some different families and we were all kind of praying. You've kind of heard these stories and discerning what the Lord had next for us. And one of my first uh, lunches was with Jesse Preston. Many of you know Jesse and I don't think he's able to be here today, but this is all kind of his fault. I like to blame it on him because all the way back then before local church was even a thing, he's like, you need to teach on Romans. I was like, yeah, that would be great. Romans is awesome. He's like, no, I'm serious. You need to preach on Romans. And so then we start the church and every once in a while he would just drop that in like, when are we gonna do Romans? When are we gonna do Romans? He loves the book of Romans and for a really good reason. Um, and so I've been teasing him this week, like, hey, Jesse, this is, this is it, uh, here we go. And, and so I'm excited and I'm also um, 
I think, appropriately trepidatious because uh, Romans is a powerful book of the Bible. They're all powerful. They're all inspired by the Holy Spirit. But Romans, as the image shows, has some concrete blocks that are absolutely foundational to our faith. And it's really important. And so some of you maybe have heard of the great preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones from the last century. Uh, He was a pastor for many, many, many years. Uh, He's known as a great preacher, but he's most known for preaching through the book of Romans for 12 years. 12 years, every week, he preached through the book of Romans. I think it added up to like 366 sermons. And there are others who have done Romans for years and years. It is so dense with the essentials and the bedrock of what the gospel is that you can never mind the depths of it. And that's true for all of God's word. But Romans is some heavy duty stuff. And so there are 16 chapters in Romans. And as Wes said, we're not exactly sure how long this is gonna take. I don't think it's gonna take 12 years. I don't think I'd make it. Um, That's kind of morbid and I didn't mean it that way. but I'm excited what the Lord's going to have. Romans is, Romans is the Apostle Paul's uh, most lengthy and thorough explanation of the gospel, his most detailed description of the essentials of our faith. And so verse by verse, chapter by chapter, it's like he's laying block by block this foundation of our faith. And so that's what we're going to be getting into. Um, few things as I was reading and studying over the last couple of weeks, um, the Lord has used the book of Romans in, in profound ways throughout the centuries, throughout the years of God building his church around the world. Here are a few examples. And you may not be as familiar with some of these historical figures, but write it down and maybe Google them on your own. Uh, we're not going to take the time today. But St. Augustine, maybe you've heard his name. He is one of the early church fathers. He's from the fourth century. He was kind of a hellion. He was living his life, doing his own thing, and he was tormented by it. And one day the Lord got his attention, and it was through the book of Romans. And the book of Romans totally changed his life. And so much of who we are as a church, even today, stems from what God did in St. Augustine's heart hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Then you fast forward a little bit in history to the fifth century. Uh, St. John Chrysostom, he's considered the greatest preacher of the fifth century. He had Romans read to him once a week because of the richness of the word of God that's there. Martin Luther, fast forward about a thousand years. Some of you are familiar with him. Uh, From the 16th century, a devout German priest who had been striving and seeking to honor God with his life. He was trying to do all the things that the priest had told him to do and just denying himself. And as he studied God's word and, and learned about the righteousness that God requires, it left him in a place of despair. And according to his own writings, he confesses even hating God. Martin Luther confessed that he hated God at one point because God required him to do what he discovered he could not do, and that's be holy. And so Martin Luther, in his frustration and anger and just despondence, the Lord used the book of Romans to open up his heart and to open up his eyes to the truth that Jesus did what Martin could not do. Jesus has done what we cannot do. He has given us his righteousness because ours won't cut it. And that's the beauty of the gospel. It changed Martin Luther's life. It changed the life of the church. Then John Wesley, the great evangelist of the 18th century, he's also known as the founder of the Methodist church. His life was completely changed as you read the book of Romans. The Holy Spirit has used this book over and over again to shape the church And John Calvin even wrote that Romans is the doorway to the treasure of all of Scripture. Romans is the doorway to the treasure of all of Scripture. So if you've been around local, even just for a little bit, I'm sure you've already heard us reference Romans multiple times because it is so foundational to our faith. So theologian F.F. Bruce writes this. He says, there is no saying What may begin to happen when people begin to study the letter of Romans? So, let those who have read this far be prepared for the consequences of reading farther. You have been warned. And so, I would echo that warning to all of us today. I am really excited to dig into this book together as a church. It's not only going to lay 
a firm foundation for our faith, but you're gonna be surprised at how it will address so many issues that are still contemporary to us today. All of God's word applies to us today, but we're gonna hit sexuality and politics and ethnic differences, and is God's judgment and wrath a real thing? It's all there, and the Lord's gonna open our eyes to it. You ready? Okay, let's go. You ready? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for your word to us. It's a gift that we do not deserve, but in your love and grace to us, you have chosen to use words, the power of your words and the power of your Holy Spirit to change the hearts of men and women, young and old, and to build your church. And so, Jesus, we ask that you would help us to understand and to receive all that you have for us today and in the days to come as we open your word in the book of Romans together. If you believe that, if you desire that, would everybody say amen? Amen. Amen. All right, another thing you hear us often say is context is king. Context absolutely matters. And we've covered uh, several of Paul's writings in the New Testament. Um, We've done Ephesians, we've done Colossians, we've done Galatians. And so each letter that Paul has written, he writes to a certain people in a certain city at a certain time in history to address specific things. You got that? And so Romans is no different. There is a specific context that Paul is writing into. And so here is what we need to know. This isn't just historical fluff. I'm telling you, the more I dug into this over the last couple of weeks, the more I was like, I never got that part before. This stuff is fascinating, and I think you're going to find it interesting too, and it really helps to unlock and frame up where we're going in Romans, okay? So here's the deal. Paul writes this letter to the church in Rome about A.D. 56 or 57, early 57. This is about 25 years after Jesus' death, uh, burial, resurrection, and ascension back to heaven, okay? So the church has been growing for about almost three decades now when Paul writes this letter. Paul is now on his third missionary journey. We've got a map of this. Ignore the red line that comes after where we're reading, but the, the blue and the green and the yellow and white lines, those are his different missionary journeys where God had called Paul to go to all of these different cities throughout that region, planting and encouraging churches. And he'd get done with a loop and he'd go do it again. So he's doing this for years and years and years. It's recorded in the book of Acts, okay? And so Paul writes this letter as he's near the end of his third missionary journey. And from some of the references in Acts, he most likely writes this while he's in the city of Corinth in Greece, okay? Some things point to that fact. Here's something super interesting. At this point, Paul has never been to Rome. The apostle Paul has never been to Rome when he writes this letter. He didn't start the church there. Most likely Peter didn't start the church there. Uh, Paul doesn't personally know the leaders of the church in Rome, and yet he writes this letter. And the interesting thing is, is that we don't actually know who founded the church in Rome, which is super weird. Scripture and history don't attribute it to any of the apostles. Some people have different opinions, but there's no strong opinion. It's not clear. But most likely the answer is found in Acts chapter 2. This is what most people believe is the case. How did the church in Rome start? Several house churches throughout the city. How did it get there if the apostles weren't responsible for taking the word of God there? Acts chapter 2, you remember, on the day of Pentecost, devout Jews that were living throughout the known world of the time, they came to Jerusalem as they did annually for the feast of Pentecost. They came to worship And that included Jews, Acts 2 tells us this, it included Jews and converts to Judaism from Rome. Jews that were living in Rome. They traveled from Rome for the Feast of Pentecost. The day that the Holy Spirit fell in that upper room on Jesus' disciples that were waiting for the Spirit to come as Christ had promised, that day they began preaching the gospel in tongues. The Holy Spirit calls them to speak in tongues. And as all of those other Jews from different parts of the known world that spoke different languages, as they hear the apostles speaking in tongues that day, scripture tells us that each of them heard in their own language the testimony of Jesus Christ. You remember the story? And so many of them came to faith in Jesus. These devout Jews came to faith in Jesus that day as a result of what the Holy Spirit did on Pentecost. And so... Scholars believe that some of those Jews from Rome 
that were there on the day of Pentecost, came to faith in Jesus, went back to Rome and started churches. I think that is absolutely amazing. Rome is the epicenter of the world at the time. It is the world power. And God uses ordinary unnamed people to establish his church there. For over 20 years, the church is growing. Church in Rome. So the Lord loves, once again, using unlikely no-name people to accomplish his purposes, and he does it today. What else? History in Acts 18 tell us that in AD 49, this guy, the Roman Emperor Claudius, he decided to kick all of the Jews out of Rome. And for about five years, he kicked them all out, and after five years, they began to, to assimilate back in. But here's the deal. Who was the church in Rome started by? Jewish Christians. And so they had been thriving for about 20 years. The church was being built, growing. And then all of a sudden, the emperor says, all of you Jews got to get out of here. If you're of, of Jewish descent, see ya. The Jews have to leave. And so what had, become, what had been established as a church of Christian Jews overnight turns into a church of primarily Gentile believers, non-Jews. And it continues that way for the next five years. So then after five years, the Jewish believers start moving back into town. They start coming back to Rome and they start coming back to church. They want to rejoin the church. Just use your imagination. How do you think that went? How do you think it went for this whole group, ethnic group of people to be gone from a church that they started? They're gone for five years as refugees. They get to come back. The piano was moved, the walls were painted different, they changed the carpet, they cut down the tree that you planted in memory of your grandfather out front. You gotta believe there were some issues and it was very uncomfortable. And maybe you can relate, maybe um, even students, may, or maybe if you're older, maybe you're in high school, maybe you played a sport and then you took a season off and then you decided the next season, I'm gonna play again and it just wasn't the same. Maybe you've experienced that where it's like same team, same kids I kind of grew up with, but it just wasn't the same because you were gone for a little bit, right? Maybe you've grown up in this area, Northeast Ohio, you moved away for college or moved away for a career for a while and now you've come back because you loved your time and it's kind of special to be back home and then maybe moving back home wasn't everything you thought it was gonna be, right? Like some things are the same and some things aren't. And it can kind of rub you the wrong way. Maybe you've left a church before and you were gone for a season and then you came back. The Lord led you back to that church. And you're like, some of the same people are still here, but it's just different. When you were gone, life continued to move on. And when you tried to step back in, it's uncomfortable in a variety of ways. There were some issues. And so to put it simply, that's why Paul writes this letter. And that's why as we go through it, you'll hear him addressing those two different groups over and over again. It's like, Paul, why do you keep talking about the Jews? And then you talk about the Gentiles and you talk about the Gentiles and then you talk about the Jews and you're dropping this and you're dropping that. Like, it just seems like he's going back and forth. This is why. There are these two, factions is too strong of a word, but there are these two groups in the church that are trying to figure out life together again in the body of Christ. After some water had gone under the bridge. And so Jews and Gentiles, what's the issue? Well, the Jews for all of their history were God's chosen people. Many of you know this. He picked a guy named Abraham and told him, like, I'm going to multiply your descendants. You're going to be my special people. And I'm going to bless all the people of the earth through your family. And because of that, you're not to live like everybody else. You're not to live and eat and do all the other things that the other nations do. You're special to me. And so he gave them the Ten Commandments and a bunch of other instructions for living lives that honored him. God said, the Jewish people are meant to be different, to honor me. But here's the thing, and we know this, they were absolutely terrible at it. Just like us today, they were terrible at it, and he continually had to rescue them. But God wasn't surprised. He knew it all along. This was all part of his plan. He knew that ultimately he needed a rescue plan, and that plan all along before he created anyone and anything was Jesus. 
Jesus was the fulfillment of God's rescue plan. And Jesus, on purpose, by design, was born a Jew. He was born into the Jewish family. He was a descendant directly of King David, as the prophets foretold. And so for generations, the Jewish people considered themselves as better than everyone else, because that's what humans do, right? We figure out ways to put us above anybody else. And so they're like, we're God's special people. Who are you? And so it got pretty nasty. They would call Gentiles dogs, which was like the biggest cut you could make on somebody in that time. And remember, they weren't really good at being like God, and that's why he had to come rescue them. But so fast forward to what we're talking about today, the, the Jews that placed their faith in Jesus and started the church in Rome. You got to believe that they brought with them a lot of their Jewishness, some of the rules and regulations that they had grown up with in Judaism, which weren't bad. But just some of the expectations of how they thought church should go and how they thought it, what it, they thought it meant to live for God. Even as Christians now, they probably wove a lot of that stuff together in this church. And so when they leave town for five years, the Gentiles are like, they don't have all of that history. They don't have all of that tradition. They don't know dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. And so they're kind of like making church like how they want it. And they're like, this is the little bit of teaching that we have. We believe that Jesus come and saved us and we want to worship him and we want to learn more. And so... The Jews come back, things have changed, things feel different, and you have these dynamics. It's kind of like the tension between, and and we can relate, someone who grew up in church and someone who didn't. And some of you know exactly what this feels like, and some of you have have shared that with me, and you'll be in small group, and people, and, and even like me preaching, like I'm dropping stuff, and you're like, I have no idea what he's talking about. Where other people in the room are like, I know exactly what he's talking about. I grew up in church. And so you can have this sense of like the in and the out. Someone who knows all the Bible trivia when questions are asked and someone who's like, I didn't grow up learning that stuff. I'm like at a huge disadvantage. I'm still learning basic Bible stories. And so that can be a really tough tension. Can we all just nod and agree that that's a tough tension? And the temptation is on one side, there can be an arrogance and a pride or an insensitivity like, What do you mean you don't know these things? And on the other side, it can be a deep hurt and an insecurity and can cause tension. For those who grew up in church, you'll get the illustration of the prodigal son. It's kind of like that tension. You've got the older brother in the prodigal son story who is like the Jews. He thought he had it all together. He thought that he was better because he kept all the rules. But the fact is that his heart may be even more messed up than the younger brother who would be more like the Gentiles, just kind of did whatever he wanted to do. Or maybe even more simply, Jews felt like they were the A team and they considered the Gentiles to be the B team. And there was this tension. So as we're back in church together, there's this tension over what should they and shouldn't they do? The Jews had very specific laws about the foods that they could eat, and Gentiles didn't. And so the Jews are like, I'm still uncomfortable eating bacon. And the Gentiles are like, Peter said we could eat bacon. What do you do? What do you do with the church potluck? It's kind of awkward. Let's bring it in the modern times. Some churches can't have alcohol if you're a Christian. Other churches, Jesus turned water into wine. What do we do? Right? Right? There are these issues of life together that we come to the table from different backgrounds, different experiences, different expressions of the body of Christ. And it's like, how do we do this thing? They're wrestling with things on how they should worship. What day should they worship on? Who's right? Who gets to decide? And so Paul starts hearing these things as he's in Athens. He's hearing these reports like, Paul, I think there's some beef going on with the church in Rome. Paul's like, I've never been there, but I could write a letter, I guess. And so Paul sits down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he starts to write them because he recognizes that if these things are causing the disruption, he recognizes that their foundation must be a little shaky because these things that they're starting to bicker about aren't the gospel. The gospel affects those things, but whether you drink alcohol or don't, that's not the gospel. 
Whether you wear shorts and shirts or not, I'm sorry to say, not the gospel. The gospel may have implications for those things, but that is not the foundation of our faith. That is not the foundation of our church. It's not our attire when we come in. Maybe you grew up in a church that holiness and cleanliness is next to godliness and you don't smoke or chew or play cards or go with girls that do. Maybe that's how you grew up. Not the gospel. Not unimportant, but it's not the gospel. And so Paul's like, all right, we're gonna start from scratch. And that's why this is the most thorough explanation that Paul writes of the gospel because he wants to lay this foundation that cannot be shaken, okay? Romans chapter one. Spent a lot of time on setup today. We're gonna to spend a little bit shorter time in the text, but it's really gonna open it up for the rest of the weeks to come where we're gonna really dive deep. Verse one, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. If you don't remember Paul's story, Paul was a top level Jew. I mean, there were only one or two steps above the position that he had. Highly educated, highly powerful, influential, successful, wealthy. Uh, and he was also a religious terrorist. When the church was started, uh, when, after Christ had risen from the dead and the church is expanding, Paul, uh, as a Jew, was seeking to hunt down Christians, put them in prison, have them tortured or even worse. He was trying to stop the spread of the faith. That is Paul's story. That is who he is. He gets the Jewish thing. He gets the elite feeling of being a Jew. But Jesus appeared to him on, on one of his trips to put some Christians in prison, completely changed his life and called him to spread the gospel. So that's what Paul's talking about. Servant of Christ called as an apostle. He's like, Jesus showed up, changed my life. He chose me, he picked me, I didn't choose this. He called me and then sent me. An apostle means someone who is sent. He sent me now to preach this good news, the good news that has changed my own heart. Verses two to four says this, it says, for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh and was appointed to be the powerful son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So Paul is writing now to a predominantly Gentile church that had been founded by these Jewish believers. And so it seems like he's reminding the Jews here because he's writing to both groups that this has been God's plan all along. Like, yes, Jesus came according to the prophets but he came for all people. The prophets were always pointing to Jesus. And so he's got a lot of references to Jewish history that the Gentiles most likely wouldn't have understood or would have gotten, but he's speaking to both groups. Verse five, through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of Jesus' name among all the Gentiles, including you who are also called by Jesus Christ. He's saying Jesus has called us to preach the good news to the Gentiles. It's for everyone. This has always been the plan. Even to you who already believe, you need to hear the gospel again. It's what Casey said and prayed earlier. The gospel is a daily thing we need to be reminded of. Verse seven, to all who are in Rome, loved by God, called as saints, Again, it's that calling that they didn't choose Christ. Christ chose them. They were called. They were set apart, chosen by God. It's going to return to the law a lot. Call to saints, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's his introduction. That's his greeting. And we get into verse 8. Verse eight. He says this. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because the news of your faith is being reported in all the world. So apparently good things have been happening in this church for 25 years. Like it's, it's known throughout the known world. Like Paul and all of his travels around that map, he's hearing reports of, hey, have you heard what's going on in the church? And I'm like, that's pretty amazing. Like for a long time, apparently Paul's been hearing really good stuff. Like fruit is coming from this church. And now more recently, he's hearing some of the challenges. And then from verse nine to 15, if you didn't catch it with Casey, I'm, I'm pointing it out because I want you to, to listen for the tone here. There's something interesting taking place. Listen to 9 through 15. He says, God is my witness. 
whom I serve with my spirit in telling the good news about his son, that I constantly mention you. He's never met these people before. Always asking in my prayers that if it is somehow in God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I want very much to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I think that's beautiful. To be mutually encouraged of what God is doing in you, the spirit of God is doing in you. I want to be encouraged by that, just like I want to be an encouragement to you. 13, now I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters. He says it again. That I often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now in order that I might have a fruitful ministry among you, just as I have had among the rest of the Gentiles. I am obligated both to, to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Do you get this sense there that he's, he's almost trying to like reassure them, like, I, I swear, I promise, God is my witness, I've been trying to come see you. He says it like three times. It's like, dude, chill. <laughs> like, it's okay. But he feels this tension, right? Like, it's an awkward tension, even for us to read 2,000 years later. He's like, I, I promise, I was trying to come. I'm going to get there. Like, this is, I, I was trying, but God prevented me. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Why is this the case? Uh, Douglas Moo writes this. He says, the strength of Paul's assertions about his desire to visit the church suggests that some Roman Christians may have felt slighted that the great apostle to the Gentiles had not yet come to the capital of the Gentile world, right? Remember Paul's primary call was to the Gentiles. That's where he spent on that map most of the time he was with Gentiles. And yet he had not yet been, years and years had gone by, he hadn't yet been to the epicenter of the Gentile world. And so we can kind of pick up on that. Like he's, he's almost like agitated, almost feels embarrassed. Like, I promise I'm coming. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm going to get there. And so some of his letters, many of his letters are written while he's in prison, right? Because he was delayed in ways he didn't expect. And in his letters, he'll say things like that, like, this prevented me. I long to be with you. God willing, I'll be there. So he always has this angst and this heartache. Like he loves these people. He wants to be with them. And we've talked about this before that had he not been delayed and imprisoned, we wouldn't have these letters and books, right? That God and his plan allowed Paul to be frustrated, allowed Paul to be in prison so that he would have the time to write down these things so that we could read them today. And the same is true for Romans. We just read, Paul has all this angst that he hasn't been to Rome, but the fact that he hasn't been to Rome yet, he finally has to sit down and write this 16-chapter letter that we're reading 2,000 years later that has so dramatically shaped the Christian faith over the centuries. And now we come to what many call the theme verse of Romans. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul had been ministering for a long time to a lot of different people. We've read in some of his letters that different people had been opposing him. They'd been slandering him. They'd been spreading lies about him. They had been mocking his teaching style, that he wasn't a great speaker. They said he's not impressive. He even looks weird. He's been beaten so many times. He probably was disfigured. And so he's been knocked on for a while now. And so news like that kind of spread. But Paul doubles down. That's where that's coming from. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. People are saying they're trying to add on to it, which we read in Colossians and Galatians. People are trying to add to the gospel. He's like, I'm not ashamed. That's not the gospel. I'm not ashamed of what the gospel actually is. That's why I'm writing this. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation. The good news of who Jesus was and what he has done for this is the power of God that saves us. To everyone who believes, what does everyone mean? What does everyone mean? In the Greek, what does everyone mean? It means everybody, all y'all. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. 
First to the Jew, because that's the people that he came through, but the plan all along was then through the Jews to all the Gentiles, to all the peoples of the earth. He promised Abram, I'm gonna bless you to be a blessing. All the nations of the world will be blessed through your family line. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In other words, from beginning to end. It's the righteousness of God that he has given to us from beginning to end, just as it is written. And he quotes the prophet Habakkuk here. It might be in bold in your Bible. It says, for just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So even in the Old Testament, when God's people had the Ten Commandments and they had the law and they're like, oh, we can't live up to this and we're really trying hard, even back then, the Lord made it clear that the righteous would live by faith. It's not about their righteousness. They have to put their faith in the one who is righteous and receive it from him. Righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, from beginning to end. The gospel is the good news for every part of life. The gospel isn't just to get us saved. Uh, You've heard Pastor J.D. Greer say before that the gospel isn't just the diving board into Christianity. The gospel is the swimming pool. It's everything. That is the life of Christianity, is to be reminded and to live into what it means to live into what Christ has already accomplished for us. So, what does this look like for us? Uh, All of us come from different backgrounds, various experiences and life situations, whether you were churched or unchurched, like I said, whether you were from various denominations. Some of you I know were in cults. Uh, Some of us have just had a very, very different kind of experience growing up. Maybe you came from churches that sang hymns, Maybe you've been in churches where they argued about communion and baptism and men and women in leadership and do we recite these prayers or we just pray them off the cuff? Like all of these different experiences and expectations that we can bring into church. We've been formed by these things that we've been taught and we've been formed by things that have just been caught. Like we've just experienced things and it's formed our opinion. And that bleeds into everything. It bleeds into our politics and how we raise our kids and our families, how we engage our neighbors, how we function in the workplace, all of this stuff. And so that's why the email today said like, what do you believe? And sometimes we just kind of live our Christian life just assuming certain things and we think we know some things, but we might kind of have a block over here and a block over here and a block here. And if we really take the time to think about what is justification, what is righteousness, what does it mean to be called a saint? Like what, what is the purpose of baptism? We can have all of these blocks and we can think that we're pretty good, but the more we think about it, we can start to see like, oh, I haven't really thought through that. And how does that interact with this? And where does this get put into place? I want to encourage you that that is what Romans is going to do for us. It's going to go through these things incrementally and explain this is what this is. What what is depravity? What is sin? What What is the wickedness that we have done, that mankind has done? What is Christ's righteousness? What are these things, these words that we use? What does it mean? And how does it fit together in the gospel? And so if you've wondered about those things, maybe you've been a believer for 10 minutes or maybe you've been a believer for 80 years, the Lord wants to solidify our foundation in him. So the beautiful thing about that, just as I believe it did for the church in Rome at the time, as Paul writes these things, is number one, it's gonna convict us. As he holds up what is true and we look at it and it's a reflection of our own hearts, we're gonna be like, okay, if that's what that means, then that is not me, or my heart is not there, or that's not how I think about things. Okay, Lord, I need to repent. I need to repent. Another thing it will do is it will encourage us, like, oh man, as we look at the beauty of the gospel and what Christ has done and the love of God poured out to us through Christ, as we begin to study those things and look deeply into those things, it will produce in us beauty and worship and peace and hope and joy as he puts these blocks together and that will ground us in Jesus. And as we 
begin to understand and live into more and more what the gospel is, then as we do that as a church family, what that does is it brings unity. Because it's like, no, this is the gospel. And if we all agree on that and we're on the same page and we have the same foundation, then some political views, we can give each other grace. It's not the gospel. The way that we dress, it's okay. It's not the gospel. Are you tracking with me? And so let's make the main things the main things. And that's what this exercise in Romans is gonna be. Would you bow with me? God, I've been reminded over and over this week that life is not about me figuring it out and my righteousness. It's not about me getting things right so then life will be okay. But Lord, you have been reminding me multiple times a day lately that apart from you, I've got nothing. And I'm so grateful, Lord, that you move toward me. Now, like Martin Luther and the others we mentioned, looking at the righteousness and, and of who you are and what you require and then seeing my own life is a very frustrating and demoralizing place, recognizing that, Lord, I can't do it. But, Lord, even today at the outset of this book, we've already been reminded that you are the one who calls us. You are the one who pursues us. You are the one who gave your son for us. And you are the one who calls us to believe, to trust you and to receive your righteousness, to restore our relationship with you. So Lord, for those today that are discouraged, I ask that your spirit would bring encouragement. For those that are feeling hopeless, Lord, would you breathe hope into our hearts today? For those, Lord, that have been arrogant and have looked down on others and their opinions, Lord, would you bring conviction and grant them the gift of repentance? Lord, as we become more and more centered in our understanding and our dependence on the gospel and who you are, we pray, Lord, that it would bring a deeper unity and a deeper strength in your church that you are promising to build here. In Jesus' name, amen.